one. All right, welcome to the latest episode of the Coleman Power Organic Fitness Podcast. I have my latest guest here in front of me, Kira Shines from Shines Tuna. Welcome to the show. Thank you very much for having me. How are you keeping? Doing very, very well. I suppose I brought Kira on to I suppose tell us, I suppose, maybe a little bit more about the product that her and her family have. And I suppose, Kira, if you could do what I like to call the elevator pitch on who you are, what you do, and I suppose anything about yourself to tell the listeners are you setting a timer for this elevator pitch i haven't done one in a while (laughs) um right well i'm kira shine as colman has so uh formally introduced me as so that's me um i am the eldest of three daughters uh to john and marianne shine who are the co-founders we're the three co-founders of shine seafoods so we sell the world and ireland's only wild irish albacore tuna now to include a range of sardines, which are also Irish and caught locally in Kitty Bags, and a range of mackerel, um, which we're expanding on. We're expanding on uh, every year. Um, that, that's what we do. We're a family business based in Kitty Bags. I've always worked in my family business. And um, yeah, that was a terrible elevator pitch, but uh, we'll, we'll get more into it. <laughs> <laughs> that was plenty. That was plenty. Elevator pitch meant to be short, unless you're in a really long you talk. Know all building and then that's not really an elevator pitch we don't know what that is but that was perfect i want to I suppose you to tell the listeners a little bit more about how you actually became the face of shines tuna it's actually a, a slightly longer story than i suppose most other companies might be able to answer this but basically my parents owned a fish and chip shop in killy bags for nearly 21 years and from before i could see over the counter as long as i could change a bin bag or sweep the floor. I wanted to be in there. I'm the eldest of three girls. I was was still daddy's girl and I was always working with him. And towards the end of those 20 odd years, mum and dad came up with the idea of the Irish tuna. Um, My mum had been a fish buyer for a Spanish fish buying company. And she knew that this this particular, the albacore tuna, Bonito del Norte is what they call it, beauty of the north in Spain. She knew that Irish fishing boats were catching this and all the Spanish buyers were buying it because she worked for the buying company. And dad had always been a fisherman and he's always in the industry. And literally like two and two was put together and got 22 uh, one day. And we said, well, why are we not selling this? So we were still running the takeaway at the time. I'd finished college and I I couldn't get a job after college. And I really just, I'm a home girl, even though I didn't think I was. And I liked the countryside and I did not want to sacrifice everything to move to Dublin or Galway or a big city. So I stayed at home sort of I was biding my time I was working in the takeaway and then the Irish tuna sort of thing came about so fast forward a little bit the tuna started to go really well I ended up taking more of a full-time role in it and we sold the chip shop business so I was getting married in June 2016 and as part of our um our photography package the lady said oh I actually do a complimentary engagement shoot with this if you have you know, a dog or a favorite t-shirt or an item basically that you'd like uh, included in your wedding photography uh, or your your engagement photography, let me know. So I suppose being my my father's daughter, I was never going to miss a good opportunity here. So I brought a kilo jar of tuna to the photo shoot with me. So when it came to the part of her saying, you know, do you want uh, to, you know, obviously you don't have a dog with you, that was quite evident. So is there anything you want included in the photographs? And I was like, this might be a bit weird, but can I get a photograph of me with a jar of tuna? Like, I had my hair done, I had my makeup done. It was a nice, it was in the Poison Glen in the north of Donegal. It was beautiful. And this was just like a picture perfect opportunity. And after we got those photographs back, dad just insisted on using that particular photograph of me holding the tuna with everything. It went on promotional material. It went on the front of our brochure. It was used online. And that's kind of how I became the physical face of Shine's Tuna. And then people just kept saying, oh, God, isn't that lovely, lovely young girl? You know, where did you get her for the photos? And it added to the story that my dad could say, well, that's my daughter, actually. <laughs> that's great. <laughs> that's the long, yeah, that's the long winded way of how I became the face of it. But then I started talking a lot of nonsense on Instagram and doing reels and all the rest of it. Fast forward a few more years. So <laughs> who's not doing that these days? <laughs> Yeah, everyone's on the reels. and But no, it's a great way, I suppose, of showing a family run business and making you most certainly main front stage promoting the likes of something that's local and that's fresh. And I suppose that's what I kind of want to lean on uh, next yeah. to about, I suppose, sustainability. A lot of people talk about sustainability and our fish 
sustainable for the future. I suppose we could expand on that point to what you do currently know. Yeah, well, we when we started <clears> uh, on the Irish albacore tuna first, it was our first product. We came out with one product first. It was the tuna in the jar, the one that is, I suppose, our, our biggest and, and best known product even to date. And one of the things we were concerned about when, when we started getting into it was sustainability because it, it, it's, I suppose, sustainability is the word that's thrown out there an awful lot. And there's lots of greenwashing and there's a lot of misinformation out there. But I feel that the fishing industry gets a lot of a hammering for it, even though we're an island nation and we're surrounded by fish. And um, people talk a little bit less, in my own personal opinion, about the sustainability of other, other meat production, whether it's chickens or poultry or uh, beef or anything like that, I find fish gets a big, big hammering. So we were concerned about the, uh, the sustainability and overfishing of this particular species because this was going to become our main business and what we were putting all of our effort into. So we did a little bit of digging and it turns out that it's an exceptionally well-managed fishery and the quota in Europe for, it's usually about two and a half thousand tonne per year, plus or minus a little bit. It gets reassessed every year the boats have to individually apply for their quotas and they have to meet certain targets every year for this fishery. Um, BIM then, which is a boardish Gowara, so the Irish Sea Board effectively, fisheries board, um, they have uh, these things called fishery improvement projects, a FIP, an FIP. And there's a FIP for brown crab and there's a FIP for a couple of other different fisheries all around the world, loads of fisheries all around the world. And the albacore tuna was then going to become part of this FIP because it was, it, it's a prime Irish resource, basically. Um, we only buy from the Irish fishermen, fishing boats off the Irish quota um, in Irish waters. But funny enough, uh, other European countries like the Spanish fishermen and the French fishermen, just for example, those two, they prefer to catch their albacore tuna in Irish waters as well. So we're only taking a fraction of it. We're being cleaned out by the rest of them. But uh, I'm probably deviating a little bit, but the reason that they catch the Irish fish as, as much as they can instead is the, the albacore tuna are a migratory species. So I'm doing a wiggle with my fingers. No one can see it because when this goes on the podcast, no one can see me wiggling my fingers. <laughs> but they're a migratory species that they start off in the Bermuda Triangle. And then they basically go the whole way across into uh, the Mediterranean and they go into the Canterbury Sea. And when they're in the Canterbury and the Mediterranean and they're heading up towards Ireland, they're eating their pilchard, they're eating their anchovies, they're eating their squid. and they're, they're, they're a complete wild animal. They're pure muscle. And like if they don't swim, they don't live. So they get all their goodies. They go on ahead up. And when they hit the Irish coast, they're actually in peak condition. They've done their training. They've done their food. They've had all their single ingredient foods as well. <laughs> they've had all that stuff. <laughs> and they are just top of their game when they're in the Irish waters. And I think don't quote me on this, but when the water reaches between nine and 11 degrees, there's, a, there's an exact figure, I can't, don't know which one it is, uh, they head back again. And that's their migratory circle. Um, so when, when they're in the Irish waters, they're, they're, in, the peak, they're in peak condition. But um, back to the point of sustainability, uh, because it's such a well-managed European fishery, we were really content to go ahead with that. Um, one of the main focuses of any of the products we ever launch and from day one was to not, not not bring a product to market that we weren't 100% satisfied with, either the ingredients or any added flavors or the quality of it. Um, if we weren't 100% happy with it and couldn't completely stand by it from a, a quality and sustainability and an ethics point of view, then, then we, weren't, we weren't going to do it. And we have actually refused certain products to bring it in our name for some of those reasons as well. But that's brilliant. And a lot of people do talk about sustainability. And then there's the issue of such food items, whether it be fruit or vegetables that are shipped halfway across the world. We'll take the example of avocados or something that's typically uh, on a lot of healthy food choices. But for the most part, that isn't that sustainable. It's definitely not growing that well here in Ireland. No, definitely not suitable for, and you know that yourself, but I don't, can, can you grow them in Ireland? No. Uh, they, won't fl- they won't flower, and that's what turns into a fruit. So every flower turns into a fruit. Oh, okay. <laughs> they no, don't. They're not for here. But um, yeah, there's the other thing about sustainability, and people talk about carbon footprint as well. Um, if just because you see something in your supermarket that says it's a sustainable product or it's got any certain certification, like it kind of goes a little bit deeper than that. Um, for example, there is a certification for fish called MSC. It's Marine Stewardship, Stewardship Council. Now, I'm not going to blab about some of the information about that, 
particular certification because I don't know enough about it to talk about it properly. But Irish fishing boats don't qualify for that because they don't meet certain requirements for the type of fishing. And that's fine. That, that, that's fine. They don't meet certain requirements. Some of the boats never will. And that's fine. But when you're buying Irish fish as an Irish consumer, or even as a consumer in the UK or across Europe, um, you're supporting people that are local, you're supporting local communities, and the carbon footprint is exceptionally low and practically non-existent when you compare it to, say, your avocados coming from Peru or wherever they come from, and then back to seafood again, which is clearly my area. Um, people talk about prawns a lot of the time and farmed fish. Um, I saw in a restaurant in Dublin, I'm not going to say where it was, they had catch of the day sea bass. Sea bass is a, is a farmed fish and 90% of the sea bass that comes into this country is farmed in Greece or even further afield. So why would you have sea bass on your menu as a restaurant or, or a supermarket when there's the most amazing white fish caught and landed into Kilmore Quay and landed into Port and Cork and all around the country and it's, it's Irish and it's supporting people that are local and it's like my, back to the word sustainable, my dad always says the most endangered species in the Irish fishing uh, are the fishermen and that they need to be supported as well. But uh, back to prawns there. Uh, prawns and actually the majority of the, the current canned fish category in nearly every supermarket that I've ever been in, with the exception of Shines, <laughs> has such a high carbon footprint that if you knew how far some of the stuff travelled and dad's famous quote is, we import produce from as far away as humanly possible and we export our own stuff as far away as humanly possible like where is the sense in that like that's not sustainable regardless of how it's fished or the type of fish or anything like that like go back to the absolute base of it all where's it coming from who at the end of the line is being is being affected by your purchases basically like it really like certificates aren't all they're cracked out to be <laughs> Yeah, the food system is slightly messed up in the sense that we do produce, we produce fruits and vegetables and the likes of fish and other things, and we ship them exactly like you just said, halfway across the world, which is nonsense. Yeah, yeah. when we could be the ones benefiting from that. Um, I take take our sardines, for example. It's I can't take any, any credit for the, for the sardine product that we have at the minute because it was all, it was all Mr. Shine. Uh, he was kind of semi-aware, but not really, and then did a bit of investigative work. That the sardines that, that we actually can are landed uh, in kitty bags. They're landed in several ports around the country. It's a really small inshore fishery. Um, but the ones that we have for our for our first batch are we actually we know the fishermen, we, we meet them most days in kitty bags, like we know the boat, we know the family, and it's fantastic. It's as it's as close to home as we're able to get with any of our products. Um, for example, the Irish tuna aren't landed into kitty bags, they are landed into Castletown Bear and Cork. Um, and that's predominantly because they have the license for landing that fish in Ireland. So they wouldn't steam the whole way to kitty bags for any reason if they didn't have to, <laughs> especially not with the cost of fuel these days. Um, so yeah, our sardines um, are Irish caught, are by Irish fishermen landed into kitty bags. But the funny thing about the sardines that we have now is, <laughs> I think we use the word nutritional heavyweights on our, on our tins. They have such high levels of omega-3 because they're, they're quite small. So without going into too much detail, which I might do in a minute, the smaller the sardine, the better the quality. Um, and because they're so small, actually, we, a lady called us concerned about calcium levels. She thought there was no bones in them. There are bones in our small sardines, but they're so soft. And so like they're, you wouldn't even know that they were there. She was actually getting more calcium now from eating our sardines than slightly bigger ones that she'd been buying in other brands. And uh, I, th I think our sardines are probably the most sustainable product that we have because they're so local. And it's, it's an inshore fishery that I think, I think a lot of it was actually going to fish meal and going to other people, other, other brands were, were canning it as well. But we didn't know about it and we brought it to market. And again, something that we were happy to stand back behind 100% and put on the market. And what an important point did you bring up? And I often mention it, is the fact that food is and contains every vitamin and mineral that the body needs. But people are not eating enough whole foods, inclusive of the likes of your sardines and the bones being edible, high in calcium, which again, most people are taking in a multivitamin or they're buying it separately. If you paid maybe, which I'm going to tell you, um, the, like I said, the quality of the fish from Shines 
most certainly like taste it yourself taste it once and you won't go back and that's the whole example of you taste good and high quality foods you gain the advantage of the, exactly that yeah well whether it's whether it's fish or whether it's i always use the example um i i, I usually do make a fruit and vegetable juice most mornings and when i was in college there was a summer that i wasn't going to be living with my boyfriend and my husband at the, at the time and we used to juice throughout college together and I came home and I couldn't find organic carrots in the shop. So I just bought regular carrots. And I juiced them and I looked at the colour of them and I was like, what an under God is that? <laughs> it was just, it was completely different, like completely different. So that was another example of just a really high quality organic product and a natural product that I could completely see the day and night difference in. Like our tuna is day and night to, to other brands and I think our sardines seem to be as well. And our mackerel definitely is. And just a point on the mackerel is that uh, because we only use winter mackerel, it has the highest level of omega-3 because the mackerel that are caught in the winter have like they've got their winter jackets on. They've got all their all their fat and all their omegas and they're they're not spent. They haven't spawned yet. So they are, again, nutritional heavyweights. And like dad was saying to somebody on the phone yesterday, he said, I could buy mackerel now in the summer. But he goes, I could buy it so much cheaper because it's not the quality that I want. Like people actually have told us that they opened our mackerel in brine and were convinced that it was in oil of some description because it's so creamy, <laughs> but it's not, it's in water, but just back to, yeah, there's the, it, it has everything you need. Yeah. And it's great. You're right. Just like fruits and vegetables, which would be my area of expertise, food, food, fruits and vegetables come into season for a reason. And just like yeah. you mentioned, omega-3 in the likes of the oily mackerel in the winter months is really important for people. Why? Because it's anti-inflammatory, it's improving in your gut health. And remember that 70% of your immune system is located in your gut. Again, food is medicine. When people start eating these foods, they literally will feel and see and taste the difference. Yeah, and you feel better, like you said, and you look better, and you've got better energy levels. Like I was away in, I was away in Belgium for 10 days and I'm not going to lie, pizza and pasta was kind of the diet. <laughs> <laughs> Between shopping and change and accommodation and with the two kids and us and everything else, it was just sort of like grab and go and it was make sure they're fed and we'll sort ourselves later. I was as sluggish and dead with energy, whereas this week now I'm home and I'm back on my normal food and I'm drinking loads of water and I'm a different person. Completely different person. And nothing wrong with pizza or pasta now, by the way, but <laughs> too much of it. <laughs> I'm back in your own bed. Routine is key. Routine is key. And I suppose I want to bring up the likes of... Irish people have a tradition of eating fish and a lot of people now will have, I suppose, maybe salmon, but salmon isn't something that I often recommend and more so you'd know better than I would. How much of that is an often farmed? Nearly all of it is farmed. Um, if you were, well, the reason you would know whether it was farmed or not is how much you actually pay for it. To start with, wild salmon are so rare. Not that they're rare, they're rare to get your hands on. There's, there's plenty of them, but they're such a managed fishery as well. You have to go out and buy a tag, basically. You have to buy a license to catch a wild salmon. Like they're, when they're in season, like there are some fish shops, say down around Hoth and stuff, or not fish shops. Yeah, fish shops, sorry, I don't say fish and chips. There's some fish shops around Hoth that you'll pay like 50 euro the kilo for a whole salmon. And like, that's crazy. Some people say, oh, that's not very expensive, but not something that I want to touch on, but I will now that I'm here. The way people buy their fish as well, People think, oh, if I buy a whole fish, it's much cheaper than buying a fish that's been filleted and skinned and boned. By the time you take that whole fish home and you've done all that stuff yourself, you're out of fortune anyway. You've lost half the fish to start with. You can't eat most of it anyway because it's like head, bones, tails, and Irish people generally don't eat that kind of stuff. <laughs> but um, you've probably not been able to fill it or cut it properly yourself, so you've lost far more of the fish. Um, so that's one thing, actually, that I always say. I, I worked as a fishmonger for a couple of years, actually, as well. Um, but I always say to people, yeah, some, yes, our tuna is more expensive. All of our products are a premium product, but it's ready to go. It's cooked for you. It's ready. It's edible. It's, you just have to buy it and open the jar. That is the most difficult part is opening the jar. <laughs> <laughs> like price and quality and things like that are, again, fairly subjective, but um, it depends on the person, really. I don't tend to get into too many debates about price about our products. I just say, do you know what? taste it and if you like it and you appreciate the price of it then come back to me and it's usually pretty positive <laughs> but, but, um, you pay for what you get and that's key with you anything you, you buy get, you get what you pay for exactly um but yeah back to the salmon uh, it's all farmed basically all farmed um 
And look, it depends what you want. I don't rate salmon as a fish, whether it's wild or farmed. It's not a fish that tickles my fancy, basically. Um, I love cake. I love scallops. I love good Irish proper prawns. I won't eat prawns unless they're wild, basically, because the conditions in which they are farmed in are absolutely horrific. If anyone wants any more information on that, they can go and Google it or go and just YouTube it because they're basically farmed in slurry pits. Like, I'm not going to get into too much detail about it here because <laughs> if you want to eat prawns that aren't wild, you will to are you like they're cheaper, they're so cheaper, like you can quadruple the price for a, for a wild prawn. But Jesus, it's good. <laughs> it's good in quality and it's good in taste. Um, and yeah, farm salmon, it's I don't really know what else, like what I can say about it. Like it's not a it's not like yeah, you'll you'll have, get some nutritional value from it, like you absolutely will, but it's not for me wouldn't recommend <laughs> and it is not sustainable <laughs> i think dad's quote is when i say his quote it's something that i always hear him saying quite often it is true uh, it takes three kilo two to three kilo of a wild fish to feed to produce one kilo of, of a farm salmon a farm fish that doesn't make sense no that's an amazing fact yeah it's kind of scary as well and uh yeah yeah, I'm not going to talk about farm salmon anymore because I'm going to get caught up with somebody. <laughs> Someone's going to argue with me about no. it. It's not. And, I, <laughs> and I'm not trying to hear to catch out anybody. So uh, what I would like well, to touch I'm on. Yeah. <laughs> I'm a reporter. Was I'm I'm a here you began. <laughs> what I'm going to uh, touch on here is the likes of, I suppose, firstly, it was an honour to be uh, nominated as a, an ambassador for Shine's Tuna in itself. But it's something that what you're trying to do is get the word out there about people uh, consuming this high quality product and you can expand on, I suppose, that uh, mentorship program you currently have. Yeah, so our ambassador program was basically set up for that reason. I wanted to expand the amount of people that were that had access to it and could try it. And obviously, like you've told lots of your friends and family <laughs> and your followers <laughs> and Everybody, every subsequent ambassador does that. And to be honest, our friends and family, even before we had the ambassador program, were the best ambassadors that we ever had. And anyone that tries it, they're genuinely so blown away by the quality and the difference to other stuff that they've had that it speaks for itself. And like good news travels fast, bad news travels equally as fast, but still, you know what I mean? Um, so the ambassador program, I decided when I was setting it up that I did want to run it twice a year. I didn't want anyone getting to didn't you didn't want anyone commit wanting to commit like no one wants to commit I wouldn't anyway to like a 12 month ambassadorship program I felt it would be a bit too much for people they might get a bit stressed out and that it wouldn't there would be no fun in it so I was running it twice a year and all it entails is we give the chosen ambassadors a small application form to fill in and then they get if they get chosen they get goodies three goodie bags three goodie packs throughout the six months and all we want is for them to post about the product or tell their friends and family about it at least twice a month and to be fair these are all a great bunch <laughs> you included obviously but the ambassador any of the ambassadors past or present that are listening to this like everyone really gets on board and gets behind it um but back to sort of our our products and, and what we're about just for a wee second is the point that I usually bring up quite early in any conversations I have with people is yes I'm about selling the shines products and about promoting our brand obviously it's our bread and butter but the main core of our business is, is to promote seafood and to promote the Irish fishing industry. Um, that, that's really at, at the core of our business as well and really close to our hearts. Like mum has been involved in the industry for years, as long as I can remember. Dad has been a fisherman for as long as I can remember. He's not fishing obviously currently, but he was a fisherman for like 15, 20 years. All his friends are still in the industry. We have family in the industry. Um, and like from... From, from catch to, to shelf, basically we're involved in it somewhere along the line. And we have people that are close to us involved somewhere along the line. And the industry as a whole is where our passion really lies because like Irish seafood is so fantastic. All the food in Ireland, as far as I'm concerned, is fantastic. Like it's a really, for a small island nation, we produce some of the best food in the world, as far as I'm concerned. And promoting the industry is, is key to us as well. Yes, I want to sell Shines Tuna, but I'd be happy if someone else weren't around me and went, stop buying farm fish. I'm only buying wild fish now that's Irish. I'd be like, happy days. I'm good with that. <laughs> yeah. 
No, and you're doing a great job and you have a similar ethos to myself, getting people to most certainly be healthier and that comes from eating good quality foods. Yeah, absolutely. There's no two ways about it. And like you said, your gut health being the core of your immune system, like our immune system is the only thing we have to depend on <laughs> basically for any kind of like sicknesses or illnesses. So why would you not treat it relatively yeah. well? <laughs> and, and no better way, I suppose, to most certainly eat the best quality fish that's out there at this moment in time that if you haven't tried it, I highly recommend it. I suppose, Kira, before we wrap up, I want you to tell the listeners where is the best place for them to reach you and maybe say, comment on your hashtags, but I'll be sharing them in the show notes anyway. Yeah, great. Well, like our Instagram account is very accessible. Um, it is monitored by me 95% of the time. Um, our email addresses, our phone numbers, our direct line numbers, they're all over our website. Something I hate actually is when you see a website, you can't find an email address and you can't find a number. You can find everything on ours. <laughs> uh, you can buy, you can contact myself or my dad anytime, day or night is what he always says, but leave it to that. Like, I'll, I'll answer my phone before seven most evenings. <laughs> But anyway, we're, we're very accessible. We're very happy to take any phone calls or comments or emails from anybody. Like we always reply. Um, it's one thing we pride ourselves in is decent customer service as well. It's not always possible in certain businesses. We're very lucky to, to be able to do that and be in a situation where I can bounce ideas off dad. We can reply to customer queries, even complaints, uh, concerns, anything like that. We're very open about that. Um, please call me, text me, email me if you have any queries. Um, you can buy our products in all major supermarkets, done super value, most Tesco stores, um, and loads and loads and loads of independent retailers who have always been exceptionally supportive of us, thankfully. And our website as well. Uh, you can buy online on our website. Our current ambassadors all have 25% off discount codes, so go follow them. Um, Coleman, I think your code's still active, actually, so there you go. <laughs> There we go, lads. We'll, we will most certainly be uh, putting that in the show notes as well. But uh, Kira, thanks so much for us was uh, spreading the word. And I always uh, end these podcasts by saying, stay tuned, stay classy, and keep it organic. <laughs>